So if this uh, type of cataclysm really happened, uh, how does one approach the study of such an, a one-time event? Well, generally speaking today, uh, about the only way to study it seriously is by computer modeling. And so I realized this, and, and so for my PhD research, my PhD thesis, I uh, developed a numerical model for the mantle. Uh, and this is the grid that it, I used. The, the model is now known as Terra. And uh, basically the idea is to chop the mantle up into lots of small cells and then simply solve uh, conservation equations, conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of, of momentum, or for this case, it, it just uh, uh, corresponds to a balance of forces on each one of these little cells. And it takes a, a large computer to do that, but uh, in principle, it's straightforward to do that kind of calculation. And uh, this slide just shows how the, uh, that grid was, is generated from a figure known as the icosahedron. And, uh, uh, just to, for any engineers in here, just to give you a little hint as to the, the type of code it is, it's a finite element uh, formulation. I uh, just showed the kind of spherical mesh that I use. It's, uh, that mesh is naturally suited for, to be divided up into blocks, 10 logical blocks, and is nicely suited to work on a parallel computer and it has a lot of physics put into it. It can handle compressibility, spatially varying material properties, real equations of state, and lithospheric plates, and many other things. So um, I had the privilege of supervising several graduate students uh, during the 90s. And this w one of the graduate students, uh, this is part of his PhD research using Terra. And he later got a position at Princeton and, and is now a full professor at the University of Munich. So uh, this code has been used by many research groups around the world. And uh, let's first look at this question of how can rocks sink through 2,000 miles of rock within just a few weeks' time? That's an absolutely essential question if this model has, is to have any viability at all. So uh, it's possible because uh, silicate minerals, uh, it has been shown, weaken dramatically by factors of a billion or more when they're under stress. And these experiments have been in, done in many laboratories for the last 30 years around the world. This is an apparatus that uh, has been used, an uh, oven, the sample is placed in the middle of this cylinder you see and force is applied to it from the rods going in the top and the bottom and everything is controlled very carefully, the, the amount of stress applied, the temperature and from the de rate of deformation of the crystals one can uh, back out their, their mechanical properties. One can also look at them after the experiment, look at the style of deformation and this is uh, a, a photograph in effect from an electron microscope showing how planes of atoms have slid over one another. And this kind of deformation is known as dislocation creep. Very well studied, and so well studied they're able to uh, uh, generate maps like this, a map of deformation rate versus stress versus temperature. And uh, it shows that uh, this mineral olivine can deform by a fact, the, the rate of deformation can change by a factor of one billion with uh, relatively modest changes in stress. And so what, I, what I've done in this next calculation I'm going to show is, is put that, uh, represent that plot that I just showed you in equation form, put it into a, a uh, a calculation, and this is simply a 2D calculation where I can put, apply lots of computer power to it, make the cells very small, and can uh, track the 
the runaway instability that unfolds. The top panel is temperature, where red is hot and blue is cold. The arrows denote velocities. And uh, the bottom panel is the rock strength, where, where blue is weak and red is strong. And uh, this dark blue color represents a, uh, a strength a billion times smaller than what the rock would, would have if it was not under stress. So, what is this? so we're partway in, the, in a runaway regime here where these red uh, blobs, these red plumes, have suddenly uh, started rising at a high rate of speed, uh, rising toward the surface. So this is after five days into this calculation, after this runaway begins. So they come roaring up to the surface and cause the top surface, the blue region, which is cold, uh, uh, then to run away. So th this is after 12 and a half days. The, the uh, hot plumes are near the top. That, that top, uh, the cold material has, has started to run away, plunging to the bottom. Uh, the, most of the region, as you see in the bottom panel, is blue, has become very weak. And so this whole, this whole volume is, has become weak and moving very rapidly. The, the height of the box is, is two, uh, about 2,000 miles. So it corresponds, I've chosen the, the, uh, the parameters in this calculation to uh, represent the Earth's mantle. And the velocity denoted by U max there in this panel is like five and a half meters per second. That's many miles per hour. I think that's about 10, or 10 to 15 miles per hour this material is sinking. And this is at 20 days. Materials uh, uh, slowing down. Velocity is only at 2.3 meters per second here. And it rapidly uh, decreases in the bottom panel in subsequent uh, times becomes red, and uh, so it, it, uh, the, uh, the thing comes to a relatively rapid halt after the gravitational potential energy driving this, this uh, process uh, is, is exhausted. So this is the animation here, and I, I loop the animation several times to give you an idea, but this, this shows the this is an actual numerical simulation of this runaway process using actual data from laboratory experiments for the, for the deformation characteristics of the, of the rock. So uh, it's, uh, and this, is, this is a, represents some very sophisticated numerical methods to be able to track this physical instability. And a few of my colleagues have, have come up with the ability to do similar work and have validated this calculation. So now I'd like to show you a, a, few, a few results from my 3D model. And basically what the, the calculation I want to show you, I've taken a, a uh, representation of Pangaea, a, a reconstruction, an est estimate of, of where the plates were at this point in geologic history. In, in um, this is, of course, in the evolutionary time scale, but and it would occur. This this distribution would have existed uh, in the flood during the at a time during the flood. I take that uh, rough, roughly that present day continents, move them back to their Pangean positions, put coal material around most of the boundary of this supercontinent, the blue that you see there. That that blue material is. Uh, 400 degrees cooler than everything else, extends down about 400 kilometers into the mantle. This is a slice through the equator. The white area in the middle corresponds to the core. I'm not uh, including the core in the calculation. And I use this initial condition, this initial distribution of coal material to start the motion to start the calculation going, and I simply solve the conservation equations uh, uh, in the computer, allowing this system to to develop as it as it wants to. And so this is the result at the surface uh, after 15 days' time, and we see the blocks, these continental blocks, pulling apart 
primarily driven by this coal sinking material. And I have plate boundaries in the ocean areas where uh, there's evidence that they, they also existed. And we have the, these ocean plates pulling apart along those, those boundaries. So that's the surface, that's a view at 65 kilometers depth. This is a, the slice through the equator. We see the coal material sinking, um, and it, it thickens. It, those blobs get thicker because I've put in a, a higher uh, strength in the lower part of this mantle, as various lines of in, uh, evidence indicate. And uh, so this is, this is at 25 days, and there's been a lot of motion. We have velocities at the surface on the order of three and a half meters per second. The blocks are moving roughly in the right directions. Uh, this is a, a cross-sectional view, the coal material sinking down toward the bottom, eventually spreading over the bottom, and uh, the process coming to a halt. This is a, uh, a view from the North Pole at that same time, a view from the South Pole. So it gives you a flavor of what unfolded uh, during this catastrophe. Now, do we have any observations supporting a recent episode of catastrophic plate tectonics? Well, a field of study that's unfolded in the last 20 years is known as seismic tomography, uh, constructing using thousands or tens of thousands of earthquakes to uh, develop a 3D picture of the inside of the mantle. And this is uh, one of these reconstructions of the structure of the mantle. And what's uh, a feature of almost all these models is that there's a ring of coal material that borders the margins of the Pacific Ocean. And then, uh, and so we see uh, the Pacific side, and there's a blob of red material, hot material, squeezed up like toothpaste in the middle of this ring. The same ring can be seen from the Eastern Hemisphere where we're basically looking at the African continent. And uh, again, uh, 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 some, a blob of, of, of hot material, low-density material squeezed up in the middle. And uh, a big dilemma for modern geo geoscience is why this coal material is, has such a large density contrast. Uh, if it took 100 million years as the, the uh, standard evolutionary framework requires, that material should have mostly warmed up. It should not be as cold as it is. Uh, but if it only is, has been down there a few thousand years, it's understandable why it has the big density contrast. So the, the density contrast of this ring is evidence of a recent episode of catastrophic plate tectonics. Furthermore, a similar catastrophe a runaway catastrophe appears to have taken place on Venus in the recent past. And this data is from the Magellan mission in the early 1990s, which indicated the planet had been catastrophically re resurfaced via processes uh, inside the planet. And much of the planet has, has been just flooded with hundreds of meters of basaltic lava, as we see here. These bright features are cracks that formed when this basaltic lava cooled. But this lava obliterated any craters that had existed prior to this catastrophe. So there's most of a good fraction of the surface of Venus is featureless, like you see here. There are a few uh, impact craters, like we see in this photo. And, uh, but the ejecta blanket is pristine, no evidence of any erosion or degradation of the ejecta. It's as if these impacts occurred just yesterday. And this, is, uh, this led most interpreters of the data to conclude that Venus had been catastrophically resurfaced in the recent past. This is another image of, of three nearby craters, probably a single object that broke up as it went through the dense Venus atmosphere. I'd like to close here with this quote from Martin Luther, uh, who said, If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, 
I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Wherever the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that one point where the devil is attacking. Well, I say the devil has been attacking ferociously with uniformitarianism. And uh, for the most part, the church has been slow in responding. And uh, the the urgency is no less today than it has been uh, for the last 150 to 200 years. We're still, we, the, the battle is still uh, raging uh, intensely on these issues. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up to, against the knowledge of God, and taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And uh, I, I pray that all of us will come away from this conference with a renewed vision, a renewed commitment to having a part in this uh, enterprise. So thank you for your attention.